a warm welcome to each and everyone. Uh, today's lecture is being delivered by the famous senior advocate, Mr. Siddharth Luthra. Mr. Siddharth Luthra is a senior advocate in the Supreme Court of India. Mr. Siddharth Luthra has completed his law from Campus Law Center, Delhi University, and did his MPhil in Criminology from Cambridge University. Besides being a senior advocate, he served as the additional Solicitor General of India from July 2012 to May 2014. His father, Mr. K. K. Luthra, was also a well-renowned senior advocate. Mr. Luthra has got a lot of credentials as a counsel for a lot of VIPs and dignitaries, as he was a special public prosecutor in the Nirbhaya's case. He has been practicing over three decades. Though he initially started his career as a civil lawyer, he shifted his practice to criminal side and has become one of the top brass criminal side lawyer in the country. Apart from litigation, he teaches law abroad and in India. He is a visiting professor in Northumbria University at Newcastle United Kingdom. He was conferred an honorary doctorate by the Amity University. He is a member of the Delhi Legal Service Authority and the Vice President of the Indian Criminal Justice System. One of the third of his factors is dedicated to pro bono publico. He has been appointed as the Amicus Curia by the Supreme Court in the matters of criminalization of politics and various other important matters. He has written various books and published various articles. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. Today's topic is sedition and freedom of speech. So thank you, Mr. Manoj, for such a um, beautiful way of introducing the special guest today. I may now request the chief guest to um, so commence his session. And uh, we welcome um, honorable judges of uh, our high court and other high courts, and honorable judges from the Mopassil Judiciary, and um, all the senior counsels from Madras High Court and other high courts, and especially the younger members of the bar to whom um, this uh, webinar series is dedicated. So welcome all, and let me request Mr. Uh, Siddharth Lotha, the senior counsel, to come to the session. Sir, please, sir. Morning, all of you. Tradition is a very favorite subject of mine. And it's a very important area of law because its use and abuse has lasted more than a century and a half. In England, in 1984, Lord Denning said that sedition is now obsolete. His words were, and I quote, the offense of seditious libel is now obsolete. It used to be defined as words intended to stir up violence, that is disorder, by promoting feelings will or hostility between different classes of his majesty's subjects but this definition was found to be too wide it would restrict too much the free and full and free discussion of public affairs so it has fallen into disuse in the past 150 years unquote that is what denning says about the land from which we got this provision yet in india we have held on to it there are no emperors, there are no Maharajas, there are no rulers. We are all as much rulers as ruled. We are in a democracy. But we have not let go of this provision under Section 124A, which makes the doing of an act which would bring the government into, and I use these words with emphasis, hatred and or contempt or creating disaffection against government, against it, and these become punishable. The offense is cognizable since 1978, non billable non-compoundable, tribal by a sessions court, and the imprisonment can vary between life and three years. It's part of chapter six of the Indian Penal Code, which is a very important chapter, and that's the part which deals with, and I quote, of offenses against the state. So what does it contain? That chapter contains offenses such as waging war, gathering weapons to wage war, conspiracy to wage war, all acts which have a propensity for violence. Sedition, of course, are words spoken or written, and that's what makes it a very unique offense. So not only the commission of a seditious act, but even the attempt to do so has been made punishable, and anybody who even attempts to generate hatred, disaffection, is punishable under this provision. So if you write an article, or if you prepare to write an article, or if you, for example, um, write, uh, do a public speech, or even prepare to start writing an article, all of these acts will come within the four corners of the offense. Uh, now, if I may 
go to the next his, to the historical perspective. You know, the if you look at sedition, one of the classical cases was that of Socrates, way back in 300 BC in Athens. Socrates, Socrates taught the youth of Athens to question everything, to ask for reasons. A little bit like what our youth do today on social media all the time, when they desire to question in everything. And it's a very interesting outlook. So perhaps we are going back to what Socrates believed was the ideal. But of course, as then and now, this did not go down well with the prevalent powers that be. Nobody likes to be questioned. And therefore, he was questioned as being violate, as violating the prevalent moral standards, traditions in Athens, and he's prosecuted. He's charged with, and I quote, corrupting the youth, practicing religious novelties, and neglecting the gods of the Greeks at that time. Socrates denies the charges, fails to convince the jury, is made to, to drink hemlock, and that is the punishment of death which is imposed upon him. Socrates was a man before his time. He believed in reasoning. He refused to adhere to what were termed the moral norms of that society. And in his trial, he makes this statement, and so we are told, and I quote that, I would rather die having spoken after my manner than to speak in your manner and live unquote. Another interesting historical example is of John P. Zenger, who in the 18th century America, when it was still a colony of the British, writes, and there are strict, strict uh, restrictions at that time on the press and publishing, he questions the authority and the activities of the then British royal governor. He was charged with breach of the prevalent laws on publication in the United States, Ellen was a colony, because he brings out what is known as the New York Weekly Journal. He wrote a satire against governors and the council. He's put in prison, remains there for nine months, keeps editing, keeps protesting. Finally, the jury gets affected by his argument, acquits him of all charges, but not before he's not spent nine months in prison. Historically, sedition has been used by governments, especially colonial governments, to suppress dissent. So in India, you have the classic cases of Bal Gangadhar Tilak, Aurobindo Ghosh, 1908, and then subsequently you have Vinayak Sen, Arundhati Roy, and recently even the JNU case of Kanaya Kumar, which is now pending trial in Delhi. The use of protests, protests erupted when Kanaya was charged with sedition over his speech in the, uh, the Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi. Now, the beauty of this offense is that though, as I said, it's 150 years old, not that much used, but we've had as many as 47 sedition cases in 2014. These are uh, National Crime Records Bureau statistics. 30 cases reported in 2015. In 2018, the numbers go up to 70. In January 2020, we, have, we had about 3,000 protesters against the Citizenship Amendment Act. We were charged with sedition. And, in, and these are really on grounds which were the grounds taken in the pending petitions. If you recall, the matters we have gone up to the Supreme Court and certain grounds have been taken. Yet sedition was invoked. The matter is still pending in court. It will be determined whenever the lockdown opens. And in, since 2016, in contrast, we have had only four convictions of sedition. Now, if that's the kind of issue, we need to understand how this is progressing. The NCRB, meanwhile, the National Crime Record Bureau in 2017, has created, uh, has generated a category of cases relating to, and I quote, anti-national elements who are categorized as, number one, Northeast insurgents, jihadi terrorists, Naxalites and other terrorists, and 1, 1,012 cases were registered against these categories in 2018 alone. You have the example of the 19-year-old young journalism student, Amulya Naruna from uh, Bengaluru, who's charged with sedition in relation to certain statements made on protests, taken to judicial command. The fact is we are a very thin-skinned nation. We don't like listening to objections, even though the law has been settled. And this becomes apparent by the fact Bilal Ahmed Kalu, 1997, and Balwan Singh, 
protests were made by people at the corners in protests checked to policies of the government and the supreme court had to come down heavily and say a mere shouting of slogans without anything further is not sedition the fact is it reached the supreme court before this could be done and this becomes a matter of concern in 2009 this called mr bankam kishore chakke who criticizes the government on facebook he is then prosec proceeded against and prosecuted and released in bail after 4 months 22 year old activist raised a uh, protest regarding lgbt uh, uh, issues raises certain protests and that person is also being that we are facing in this country and I, and it is peculiar but before we get into the way forward i want to tell you a little about the historical development of the law on sedition and how it developed now as we all know the colonial government brought if you ever seen certain it that was in 2006 act i lay father certificate and i was surprised to see dependents my father was enrolled as a lawyer in 1949 there no that the bearer of the certificate undertakes that he will not commit any anti uh, national activities or any seditious act so this in the position under the advocates act even after independence and even after the constitution came into being sedition was in the original draft it was in macaulay's draft of the it was in the law commissioner's draft and it was there as clause 113 but by some inadvertent error we are told it got deleted it does not find its way in the ipc in 1860 and after some time in 1870 because you would recall there were certain wahhabi activities that were troubling the british or what they termed as wahhabi activities they felt that this provision should have been brought in and they bring this in immediately and at this is the same time you have the murder of the then viceroy lord mayo and justice norman of the calcutta high court and that precipitates the situation and therefore the law needs to be amended and sedition in its original form as it was in clause 113 of the draft code is brought into the law originally it had one explanation and you all 124a i'm not going to trouble you with it it gets amended in 1898 the first indian state trial for sedition is queen empress versus jogendra chand bose known as the bangobasi case a vernacular newspaper in which what was termed seditious matter was published proprietor editor manager are all accused articles are published in the newspaper criticizing the british government for posing a threat to the hindu religion and civilization because the age of consent for sexual intercourse had been raised the article accused the british of conquering and european europeanizing india using brute force and causing a negative impact on india economically and the accused were put to trial the jury does not unanimous verdict and finally the accused ten they let off but the court lays down a dis- the distinction between two crucial terms which are used in sedition that is disaffection approbation and it was really said that when you add the word dis as a prefix it means the opposite it means that it adds a negative connotation in the magazine kesri he was the proprietor and publisher these two articles were a poem titled shivaji's and a report on a meeting held on 13 june 1897 at about the same time two british officials rand and iest they are murdered tilak is charged and i quote exciting the fear against government established by law quote the british believed that their government was established by law because eventually it was their laws it is not our law the case becomes the starting point of critical interpretation of 124a and 
narrow interpretation is taken of 124a a very strict interpretation is taken of 124a and they said that words conveying hatred enmity dislike hostility contempt and all forms of ill will are good enough to bring home the charge and therefore this tight interpretation makes it very it applicable to a large class of people as long as they are just opening their mouth or writing something in the paper now these terms disaffection and disapprobation further get interpreted in an 1898 decision which was queen empress versus ramachandra narayan regarding a magazine called pratod published in satara district in maharashtra again a similar charge prosecution is based on an article and i'm going to tell you the title of the article i and i it was and i quote preparations for becoming independent unquote it was about canada and canadian citizens and how they were in, wanting independence and preparing for independence and that became the subject matter of a prosecution of course by a colonial government who didn't want to let go you then have another decision called amba prasad where in a magazine called jami ul ulam there's an article called azadi band hone ki kabal namune and he's tried in muradabad he talks about freedom and how freedom is to be achieved he is prosecuted at muradabad in uttar pradesh under 124a and def different definitions of the word disaffection come into being so finally the legislature in 1898 decides to amend it repeal the section substitute it with the new 124a and it becomes and the provision is changed a little bit and it becomes comes into the existing shape as it is now post the 1898 amendment you had mahatma gandhi who was tried you had bad ganga ganga the tilak again any percent abdul abdullah the numbers are enormous there were lots of people who were tried and please remember these people are tried for sedition yet they let it slip through the cracks when the mountain gets made so that's an interesting contradiction we very important decisions one is the federal court justice morris guire who after whom if you know delhi university guire hall in delhi university is named after him he was also the founder of delhi university just as the vice chancellor the chancellor vice chancellor so justice guire comes out and says he takes an interpretation of 124 of sedition and says it, there must be an incitement to be a likelihood of public disorder mere words are not going to be enough and his classic decision in neharendra dat majumdar was in the case of a person who speaks out in the bengal legislative assembly about the inactions or the actions of the ministry and the governor in the matter of the dakats he accuses the government and the ministry using public forces the governor of failure to maintain law and order and says compensation ought to be paid he is prosecuted and the matter reaches the supreme court and this is a very crucial decision for us contemporaneously there is another important decision and that is the fed the uh, principal decision of emperor versus sadashiv narayan rao bhale bhale rao which is 1947 and in this case the privy council effectively overrules the federal court of india's decision in neharun dat and says we have to look at 124 in the widest possible terms we must interpret it so it applies just to words it applies just to language it there need need not be any uh, in, uh, incitement or effect on public order or disorder now this is the development of the law pre independence we then move to the post independence stage sedition is discussed widely in the constituent assembly in the draft constitution there were the term sedition and public orders two grounds on which the right of freedom of speech could be curtailed by the state by framing laws however both sedition and public order do not find find place in the original constitution the reason is that the framers of the constitution were aware and conscious of this problem and that it had been used to restrict the freedom of speech mr kwem munshi one of our noted constitutional experts says this and i'm going to quote his a few lines he says 150 years ago in england holding a meeting 
or conducting a procession was considered sedition. Even holding an opinion against government, bringing ill will, was considered sedition once. Our notorious 124A has been quoted widely. I remember in a case of a criticism of district magistrate was urged to be covered under 124A. But public opinion has changed. We have a democratic government. A line must be drawn between criticism of government, which should be welcome, and incitement, which would undermine the security or order on which civilized life is based or which is calculated to overthrow the state. Therefore, the word sedition has been omitted, unquote. We then had a challenge to 124A in Ramesh Thapar's case. Ramesh Thapar was the state of Madras, 1950 Supreme Court. In Tara Singh, which is the Punjab case. In Ram Nandan, which is the Allahabad case. In Tara Singh's case, there were two prosecutions against him under the Punjab East Punjab Safety Act related to two separate speeches because they were talking about a Punjabi Suba, a Punjabi province, which eventually came into being. The issues were the validity of 124A and 153 of the Penal Court and Section 24A of the East Punjab, East Punjab Public Safety Act. The petitioner had challenged it saying these are no longer valid because now we have a constitution, we have a right to freedom of speech and expression. And these provisions are not saved by, saved by clause 2 of, 19, of Article 19. The court decides in favor of the petitioner and holds 124A to, become constitution, to have become unconstitutional as it curtails the right of freedom of speech and expression. The effect was that the government of the day gets concerned. After all, as I said, nobody really likes dissent, do they? And the government of the day immediately chooses to add two additional grounds and there's an amendment to the constitution, the first amendment, by addition of the words public order and relationship with friendly states. And these two terms get added. Subsequent to this, there is a challenge to the validity of 124A in the classic decision of Kedar Nath Singh versus State of Bihar, AIR 1962 Supreme Court 955. I'm sure all of you have known of that decision, read the decision, that's locus classicus. And the constitution bench now goes back and interprets it, saying there, is, there has to be a nexus with violence being caused. You can't just have words spoken and that cannot be the basis of sedition alone. You can't have words written and that can't be the basis of sedition alone. A person may protest, a person may object, it is the right of citizens to question. It is the right of citizens to criticize and critique governmental action. As long as it's criticism, critique, even in the harshest of words, that will not attract sedition. It is only when it reaches the point of public disorder or inciting violence, which is that extreme limited class of cases, it is then and only then that sedition can be attracted. And this, therefore, becomes a turning point where the Supreme Court Constitution bench upholds sedition in its modified form, post the First Amendment, yet at the same time reduces and narrows its scope to a point where it should be applied to the rarest of rare cases. But is that the case? Of course, I must tell you, recently in Common Cause in 2016, this issue was arraigned, arraigned, again raised because uh, petitioners had sought directions that uh, cases of sedition should not be registered unless it is approved by officers of a certain rank. Yet the Supreme Court said, Kedarnath Singh is locus classicus. It is settled the law. We don't need to look further. We just direct the authorities to follow Kedarnath Singh. And that was the principle. A lot of cases come out of political personnel. As you remember, Niharandu Dev Majandar was a legislator in the Bengal Assembly. And then we have the classic case of Mr. Arun Jaitley in 2016, where the Allahabad High Court quashed a prosecution under 124A. And that was a case where after the NJAC judgment, where the Supreme Court had stuck down the NJAC and the constitutional amendment, he had come down with a strongly worded article that there must be respect between different limbs of government, between the judiciary and the executive. And he critiqued that decision, though 
in fairly strong words. Yet the Supreme Court, yet the High Court, Allahabad High Court said that these are this is a criticism. It's an analysis. You can't call this uh, 124 is sedition, and it was quashed. On the contrary, in uh, Pugalenti's case, which is the criminal OP of 2017, the Madras High Court has taken a view that while you can demonstrate and you can agitate, uh, as long as you don't cause violence, there is no problem. There have, of course, been other cases. There have, of course, in that case, a finding that prime of Sai, the language and the content there, the FI had disclosed an offense of sedition, so the investigation was allowed to go on. Now, speaking for myself, my view is that the law is no longer relevant. It's become obsolete. And the reasons are as follows. Our masters, our colonial masters, brought in this law to suppress rebellion, to suppress dissent, to control members of an alien public who they ruled from a distant land. It evolved from Britain's oldest law, the Statute of Westminster, when you had the divine right of kings. There was a principle of feudal society which was not liable to be questioned. The Law Commission in the United Kingdom in 1977 realized sedition is no place and recommend deletion it has now been accepted and deleted in 2009 by legislation in England. So if Britain can do away with it, we who have no sovereigns, we where the people are sovereign, we where our democratic republic, a nation which comprises of each citizen is sovereign, is it really necessary for us to have an offense of sedition? After all, freedom of speech is a virtue, Article 21 is also a virtue. And wherever you are going to have this law, the threat of its misuse, the application, which is beyond the scope of law, the application to deal with uh, concerns of thin-skinned people is going to lead to an abuse of process. In this era of a constitutional republic, in this era of a democratic government, where every race, every community, every caste, every religion, comprises what we call India. Sedition, according to me, is an anachronism which needs to be done away with and either the courts or the parliament will have to intervene. But of course, the courts can only intervene if it goes to a larger bench than the five-judge constitution bench in Kedarnath Singh. Let's look at another way. The press is the fourth limb of democracy. By sedition, you often control and regulate the press. But today we have social media. Today, everybody is a writer. Everybody is an author. Everybody has the right to express themselves. And there are social, so many social media platforms that how many of us are really looking at newspapers or even relying purely and solely on traditional electronic or print media? We are not only in the information age, we are in an age where there's an information explosion and data and information is being thrown at us from every end. We have the right to choose. Sometimes we just don't have the time to choose, but we have the right to choose what we will listen to or what we will not listen to or what we read, what we won't read. So I would submit that today, all it does is curtail individuals in the press, curtail others who may speak up, but there is enough debate going around in this country from every corner of the country, from south to north, from east to west, and every bit of the country is wired and able to communicate their thoughts, their expressions, their concerns. And if that's the case, then really, does, is there any justification for it to remain? In chapter six of the penal code, you have offenses against the state, as I said earlier, 121 to 130. You have offenses against public trans tranquility, chapter 8, 141 to 160. There's sufficient to deal with. they sufficient to deal with these issues of sedition. And there is no rationale in continuing with it. Apart from that, if you look at it, we've all read the Shreya single judgment and how the Supreme Court came down on 66A of the Information Technology Act. The court took a view that there is an attempt to curtail free speech will not be accepted and struck it down. Of course, there were other reasons also to strike it down. They held it to be arbitrary, excessively disproportionately invading the right to free speech and upsetting the balance between such right and the reasonable restrictions that may be imposed on such right and thus unconstitutional. 
In 2018, the Law Commission came out with a consultation paper asking for views, revoking edition. Unfortunately, the term of the Law Commission has ended in the meanwhile. Therefore, it could not be taken further. To conclude, I will only say this, and I quote with what Pandit Nehru had said while addressing Parliament in the initial stages, and I quote, and I will end with that, take again Section 124A of the Indian Penal Code. Now, so far as I am concerned, that particular section is highly objectionable and obnoxious, and it ha should have no place both for practical and historical reasons, if you like, in any bodies of law that we may pass. The sooner we get rid of it, the better. We might deal with that matter in other ways, in more limited ways, as it should have no place, because all of us have had enough experience of it in a variety of ways, and apart from the logic of the situation, our urges are against it. I do not think myself that these changes we bring about validate the thing to any large extent. So there is defamation, there are other provisions, but perhaps it is time for all of us to seriously look at this much abused provision. We're not going to get thick skinned as we should get perhaps, and we, sh we, we as Indians don't necessarily have the ability to laugh at ourselves. But till we learn to laugh at ourselves, this provision should not make a mockery of our ability to question, to critique, and to laugh where we are entitled to laugh as a citizen, as a, as a national of India. Thank you very much. So uh, may I now request uh, Justice Anand Bangladesh, a sitting judge, to interact with you, sir? Yes, of course. So maybe, yes, sir, I think um, you can put the question, sir. Mr. Lutra wants to talk to you. May I put him on line, sir? Yes, yes. Just a minute, sir. So, Mr. Uh, Lord should be sitting in the line, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, my Lord. Uh, Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, morning, morning. Uh, morning sir. I last met, met you in the Supreme Court uh, uh, through Nitin, where we engaged you as a lawyer. We, I engaged you in a case uh, where uh, an order passed under 319 CRPC was questioned. Uh, addition yes. of, so I, I very clearly remember the conversation that we had on that day, where you said that uh, you insisted rather that. Uh, Doing trial at the beginning of uh, the career becomes very important for uh, an advocate. And uh, sort of you lamented that there is a trend where people are directly getting into the higher courts. And uh, in fact, the, the manner in which you insisted that, that they have to go and do trial, they have to know the nuances of the Evidence Act, the Criminal Procedure Court, etc. Uh, in fact, uh, it was so revealing on that day. I used to really say about this to many youngsters. That I said that today, today you are seeing Mr. Nutra as a senior advocate in the Supreme Court. But then he said that it's important you come from the basics. You start doing the basics in the trial court and then get into the higher courts. So that you have the foundation to sustain. Or else what happens is that the structure is stronger and the foundation becomes very weak. Uh, which uh, which which we, had, we were able to see. So it was a it was a it was a really a pleasure to sit and hear your uh, uh, lecture on the uh, a topic which is so dear to my heart. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think it's very important because, as you rightly said, the foundation has to be strong. Until you understand, till you've done it by your own hands. You don't know how to analyze the work of others. You will never excel. It's, uh, you know, my late father started his career in the trial court and he insisted that I do too. And I'm most grateful for that opportunity. And it's not whether you start on the civil side or criminal side. I believe civil side is very important to start with because you learn the law of pleadings. And increasingly criminal law, as we all see, is becoming more pleading oriented. Traditionally, criminal lawyers knew little about pleadings, a bail application, yes. three, four lines or five lines. Yes, but yes. now we have had to learn to read and write a little more than we used to. Otherwise, it used to be more of glib talk and thinking on your feet than really yes. deep writing. But uh, I'm often asked this question in the Supreme Court, especially when dealing with SLPs and criminal appeals on why a particular question was or not asked. And that becomes 
and the ability to respond to that and explain to that is because one has had trial court experience sometimes you have to tell a judge that asking a certain question an appellate court judge asking a certain question would have been fatal so the lawyer has actually been very conscious of his duty to his client and therefore if he has elicited answers till a certain point and not gone beyond is because that is a judgment call he took at he or she took at that time and that become very important so i i believe that uh, the foundation needs to be good <laughs> that's right thank you thank you so much sir thank you for your time thank you sir i uh, may no request mr just gr swaminathan sir to talk to you gr sir sir uh, is waiting in the lines this is gr swaminathan hello sir how are you how are you good to see you a absolutely brilliant sir and i think you have set a benchmark now i know how to give uh, that that bench we will try to adhere to when we give our lectures and only one question i have to ask is there a possibility the supreme court revisiting the issue of constitutionality again i think it will have to be done because i don't see it happening in parliament uh, in fact it is especially though this government started that process as i said through the law commission when a report was called for but it's died out and it will eventually the answer on these sensitive issues ends up coming from courts so in an appropriate challenge i am very hopeful the court will respond to it uh, perhaps that challenge will come from your court because there is a matter from your court which has already reached the supreme court and gone back <laughs> <laughs> so maybe but i had occasion to appear in that matter in the supreme court so there has been one issue which has gone up and is pending currently in the madras high court so let's see but when the supreme court has sustained the criminal defamation are you really hopeful I, look i must tell you you know appeared for one of the complainants there though it was asked to assist the court uh i think till we have to have a mechanism and i and i and that's a very important point you made we have to have a mechanism to deal with malicious prosecutions there is another law commission report on malicious prosecution which is lying somewhere gathering dust the moment you have an effective and efficacious remedy for malicious prosecution mm -hmm. and, and you also and lawyers and professionals curtail the habit of giving of prejudging issues on prime time television every evening till we change on that you will need defamation because what happens is uh despite the sahara judgment the moment a matter is pending lawyers are called upon on a daily basis as we are all aware and whether it be one or the other channel the question that's asked is are you for or against and depending on which side you are you're taken on your asked its point of view now these can actually impact the right of privacy the right of a fair trial or the right of the prosecution to have a fair prosecution mm -hmm. and that was the merit in the sahara constitution bank decision on this but i believe that we will criminal defamation is a, it becomes a deterrent for people to uh, contain themselves i'll give you a classic example you know uh, in on 20th of uh, december 2015 i was in a plane coming back from a vacation my wife and i were coming and i suddenly saw some 25 minutes calls on my phone uh, the late mr arun jetli called me up and said sadar he got on the phone and i i saw his number called back he said will you will you pay for me and i said sure i will sir but do you really want to do criminal defamation and he insisted and being a former senior being a senior colleague very respected member of the bar there was no question of saying no to him so i said so of course i'll appear for you and the result of that criminal defamation though i had advised him not to do it i said you know you just have to give evidence you'll be dragged in the mud he insisted and i believe now he was right because the moment we filed the criminal defamation and cognizance was taken on the 21st of december 2015 after that there was nothing said about him by the by the proposed accused they kept quiet so it has <laughs> impact <laughs> I mean, this is a practical experience. I'll be very honest. <laughs> <laughs> very interesting. <laughs> but I, but you know, but sedition, but defamation is about individual rights. Sedition is about using the might of the state to crush dissent. Against it. Individual quarrelling is something I can still take, but 
when the might of the state is used to crush dissent, then that's troublesome to me as an individual, to, to a person who believes in liberty. You have enough provisions in the UAP Act, you have enough provisions in other courts. But why this? Having said that, I must also confess, at the moment, I'm special prosecutor in a case where 124 has been invoked. And I'm <laughs> That's a separate issue. That's my legal job, but speaking on a personal <laughs> level, this is, my, this is my intellectual view. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So, may I then request uh, Mr. Henry Tiffin, an activist of uh, civil liberties, to talk to you? Sure. Any, uh, I'll try Mr. and answer Henry your questions as best as I can. Yes, sir. Mr. Henry Tiffin? Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. I, I enjoyed, as uh, the two judges were uh, mentioning, I enjoyed your lecture. Thank you, sir. Uh, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to uh, narrate uh, the, co the, the context in which 124A sometimes is used. I recall in Kanchipuram, there is a, there is a movement called Kanchi, Kanchi Makkal Mandram, and these people used to uh, work among the tribals in Kanchipuram district. And they found that uh, the tribals could never access any remedies from their collector uh, in the grievance meetings that were held every Monday. Therefore, on a particular Monday, they decided it is, uh, it is important to teach the collector a lesson. And they decided to place a donkey at the entrance of the collectorate and invited all the petitioners to present the petition to the donkey. This was a protest. The collector got furious. The collector who got furious is still in service. He called his SP, who is also in service today, and told him, you need to teach these people a lesson. By evening, a 124A was registered, and 15 of these activists were remanded to judicial custody. And while they were standing in remand, uh, these people having been remanded on several occasions, they all come from something which lawyers don't understand, a commune of women who live together. A commune of women who live together, they earn and they spend and work among tribals. And this is in Kanjipuram. And so they, they told the magistrate, fine, we are all accused. But where is the property in the case? Where is the donkey? And the magistrate got really furious, had to call the police, and the donkey actually was brought to court. Yes. I, I, I stopped the story there. But the question is, these are the circumstances in which ordinary people, not the, the Delhi-centric people, ordinary people against whom 124A is used. And very often we see that uh, all that is attached to 124A and the, the political pressure that is put, the judiciary also doesn't respond so generously in the lower courts when it comes to the matter of daily. It, it needed 11 years, 11 years of having to face a trial for these people to be, to be let off. So I, I so the strong opinion that um, the legal fraternity should lead, should lead the protest for removing this provision, draconian provision from our books. We don't need to wait for, for uh, the law commissions and the government. The government these days uh, will not tend to do something like that. But I think it is a legal profession which has to, to come forth and speak in public. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very valid point and I'm grateful. I, I agree with you entirely. This challenge will have to be led by the legal profession you will have to be raised in courts because governments are reluctant to let go of such provisions you know there is always something in the back of the mind that we may at some point need it and even if the leadership is liberal there are enough advisors who are more as i may call them pragmatic that pragmatism is the problem but we have to take this forward it's very important. thank you, sir. Thank you sir. Of a country, because I may have the right to protest about the language, about enforcement of a language. I may have the right to protest about my religious identity, my social identity, my ability to move out in certain areas. And, and that's something which is very dear to us who hold freedom of speech and expression. It's, and this is distinct from the freedom. I would say it can even go to the freedom to not to not the freedom to abuse. That's defamation. But the freedom of identity, the freedom of ability to let loose your thoughts, to strip, place your thoughts. That's very important. And that's what will keep us, sustain us as a country. Thank you, sir. 
May I request to advocate Santosh Pandey, sir, to answer your questions. Good morning to all of you, sir. And uh, it's a very impressive and precise uh, lecture by sir. Uh, my question is that has uh, commented on the uh, and the, on the things that why whether the uh, section of sedition or sedition kind of thing should be prevailed or not or exist or not. But uh, as far as my opinion is concerned, uh, recently in the recent past. We have heard about the Julian Assange trial in different countries. So, kind of sedition also is there. So, uh, my opinion is that uh, uh, the section 124A is not in the concurrence with the, uh, the constitutional article 19, that is fundamental right. So, how that it should be abolished, and there must be some deterrent and some. Uh, enactment of other section which must be in concurrence with the Article 19 of the Constitution of India. Sir, may I have your uh, comment on that, the Julian Assange and whether uh, this addition part of uh, kind of thing should be continue or not? Okay, I, I will put it simply like this. We are an over legislated country when it comes to criminal law. If you look at the decades post the 1980s, everything that the state wants to regulate is now being brought into the ambit of criminal law, which is not necessarily the right approach at all for a democracy. Because criminal courts are supposed to be faster, more efficient, civil liabilities are slow, there are a number of challenges. Uh, the threat of criminal action sometimes is a bit perceived to be a great deterrent. Therefore, criminal law is not necessarily the answer. Having said that, and I must I, we have civil defamation, criminal defamation. We have uh, provisions for the most heinous offenses. For example, if you're waging war or using arms against the state, you can be prosecuted under waging war provisions. You can be prosecuted for uh, unlawful activities. But those are those extreme cases. But for mere words spoken or written, there are provisions existing within the IPC. And to retain 124A, I don't believe is a justification. Replacing 124A with some other provision may also not be justified. Perhaps a little tweaking of the defamation provisions to make those trials expeditious so that they act as a deterrent and, uh, and they don't go on for years and years because unfortunately what happens in most cases is when you file a defamation complaint, I'll give you a simple example. In the defamation case I mentioned earlier, uh, we had, it went on for about three years. The respondents who were also adequately placed, one of them is the chief minister of the state of Delhi. We had about seven or seven to eight high court petitions, four SLPs, numerous revision petitions and the matter only reached the stage of post summoning of the complainant's cross-examination in three years. So if that is the plight of somebody who is a lawyer himself and has the ability to engage counsel and have support, what will be the plight of an ordinary man if tomorrow one of us is defamed, what will be our plight? The, the moment we file a complaint, the magistrate will say, sir, I have more important cases where people are in custody. I have check mounts in cases where money is to be recovered. This is only an inter fight between two people. Come after six months for your evidence. And that's pre-summoning evidence. So these become important considerations. So therefore, my view is we need to, and secondly, we and, and to answer a question which uh, our uh, which the speaker before Mr. Pandey said, and it's a very important issue, we also need to bring in an efficacious remedy and a fast remedy for malicious prosecutions. Today, the problem that we face is because of the law laid down by the Supreme Court broadly in quashment petitions, if the FIR makes out the slightest hint of an offense, criminal prosecutions can't be quashed. FIRs can't be quashed. And if they can't be quashed 
and matters are going to go on, people will face trial. There used to be a category in uh, R.P. Kapoor, 1960 Supreme Court, uh, 1968-66 Supreme Court, and later kept in Bhajindal of abuse of process of court or malefics. That's been diluted a lot. Now, I understand that mere allegation of malefics is not enough against an investigating officer or a complainant. But if there is a strong case of prior enmity made out between complainant and an accused, then we must test the false prosecution on that ground. It is being brought about in a roundabout way by calling it abuse of process. But there needs to be a greater definition. So malicious prosecutions uh, or false prosecutions should orderly be scrutinized adequately and not pass muster either before the investigating agency. And even if they do, at the cognizant stage or the summoning stage, Stage or the charge stage, and everything should not be left to the high courts to deal with enforcement petitions or in revision. That too, with rare, with limited results. Anyway, it was very good lecture session, and we hope that we will get it regularly. And thanks to all uh, listener, and thanks to very much the organizers, and obviously, sir, who are here. Thank you. So Suresh Kumar is waiting in line. Can I join him? Sure. Sure. Mr. Suresh Kumar, you can just start, start talk to sir. Person charged under this petition law definitely could not get the government job because the trial must be either the getting a three years or more than five years. Sir. So what's the interim relief they have? Sir? You see, even if you get a stay, uh, even if you get a stay of uh, the prosecution, and these stays are rarely granted. You are going to uh, suffer. I think what we need to really create a mechanism whereby the <laughs> sanction for such prosecutions, yes, sanction for such prosecutions is granted in the most limited of cases and only when it falls within the four corners of Kedarnath Singh. That's the first threshold test that will have to be laid. And that can, that can be done. The second thing is, in 1978, this was made cognizable. If it is not cognizable, again, if that cognizable to non cognizability, which is a government notification, is done, we'll have a great advantage in terms of the police is not having the power to arrest. The third thing eventually will be, as I said, try and get a stay of the prosecution. But then again, even if you were to get employment, that would be a conditional appointment dependent on the quashment of the proceedings. And as I said, stays are not always easily granted. As I said recently, there was a case from Madras High Court where uh, a magazine, and I will not give the details of that, a magazine owner was charged with sedition for certain articles that were written uh, rega regarding a constitutional functionary. The High Court stayed the sedition provisions and stayed the proceedings so far as invocation of 124 A's. Supreme Court stayed the High Court order, and only recently we were able to get the Supreme Court order vacated, and now the High Court had to hear the Washman petitions. That'll, that may be perhaps the telling case and depending on whichever way it goes, it may be carried to the Supreme Court and we may have a better answer on sedition finally. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Krishna. So now may I request Mr. Hari Ramasubramaniam to ask the question. Mr. Hari, please. Sir, you had um, uh, stated about uh, the Bhajan Lal wherein uh, uh, the case of the malicious prosecution wherever the court finds that a malicious prosecution has been made out. They might, uh, given on a case-to-case -case basis, crash it. Now, how do you reflect on that uh, with regard to 124? When you say that the state has made this particular slap, this particular case on you, on a uh, based on a malicious intent, how might that be placed? Uh, there are. Uh, you are absolutely right. Unless you can allege malefides on the part of the investigating officer investigating agency, it will be difficult to question it. Having said that, uh, that ground of malefides of the investigating officer has been diluted in PP by seeing if the charge sheet is filed and cognizance is taken, where is the question of malefides left? We will eventually have to come back to relying on Kedar Nath Singh to say that these Cases don't meet the parameters of Kedarnath Singh unless, as I said, as we discussed earlier, this matter is finally settled by seven judges. But till but the only safety wall today is Kedarnath Singh, nothing else. 
uh, malafides will be possible say for example where a constitutional functionary or a or a public figure uh, against whom questionable words are used even in the official capacity or questionable language is used uh, publicly comes out and says the prosecution should be launched should be launched against a person and or that the person will be taught a lesson in such cases you can allege malafides but those are going to be rare cases in most cases it will have to be sought to be inferred and inference of malafides as you rightly point out is not really easy in each case thank you sir now i have mr om prakash alanti a senior advocate waiting in the line sir mr om prakash sir you can ask the question sir sir i just wanted to know is there any precedent on the issue of uh, malicious or wrongful prosecution in cases of sedition i don't recall any recent uh, any any recent case but i will check it up once again and tell you uh, the uh, there was uh, the i think that was that one case which is that uh, nambi narayan case uh, uh, you know the one which dealt with yes uh, the scientist from kerala scientist from isro scientist that one in that one we we'll, uh, there was official secret sag to check whether the sedition was used i don't think it was as i recall but we'll have to verify that thank I'm you sorry thank i you. don't recall right thank you that could sir, possibly the one is nambi narayan which is that recent supreme court decision because in the context of your wonderful lecture the question comes that in cases of these kinds of uh, malicious or false fall uh, prosecution what would be the remedy which we has to like one of the speaker was asking if 3 years 5 years the trial goes on he loses everything in his in the process he loses an opportunity of a government job or he loses an opportunity of uh, getting into some other thing so this will be the area which has to be strengthened more you are absolutely right so this area needs buffering currently the state of the law is that you can prosecute a person for a false prosecution or a false uh, under the ipc or you can seek damages but as we all know you know under 182 cr ipc but these are such weak remedies and they take so much time they are not effective and therefore it is with impunity that people are put to questionable prosecutions one of the biggest concerns we have is and, and at a very small level we finally got settled in uh, nityanand case uh, and that is the case which uh, was uh, whether documents can be exculpatory documents can it all be supplied today fortunately exculpatory documents can be considered as they start to why did they been seized but supposing the officer doesn't create investigator doesn't create a record of seizure then where do you go then you have to face a long drawn trial these aberration these problems this yeah. misconduct my view of course is that as we move towards an electronic era and that is going to be the order of the day we will find that investigators will have to regulate their conduct more they will be more disciplined the old practice of keeping daily diaries or journal diaries open for 12 hours and then closing them in the midnight will have to end and that technology is going to be the game changer it is my belief and hope thank you mr ilanti sir now mr rajat mathur is waiting in the line sir so rajat mathur you can ask the question now sir i have wait sir sir i have a query sir uh, so for the charge frame for the offense of the sedition the statement of the charge has to be general or a specific one sir? it has to be specific after kedarnath singh the allegation has to be specific, to be specific. uh unfortunately as we all know there are provisions in chapter 35 of the crpc which are proceed provisions regarding failure of justice and irregularity in proceedings and the uh, and irregularities if not pointed out are acceptable if you remember that classical old decision in the context of charge which is uh, willy slaney 1956 supreme court that says that irregularities in charge will not detract from the charge as long as the accused understood what is put to them now uh, there are in fact if you look at the crpc mr mathur you will find that there are forms regarding framing of charge most people don't Thanks. see them or are not aware of them i wish we were all to look at the crpc a little more closer there is a lot not only in the body of the crpc but there is a lot within it and those performer charges and heads of charges are very beautifully placed uh, the you may want to look at form 32 form form 32 yes form 32 is the relevant i had a last question 
no, you can continue. You can continue. I had in fact gone through the commentary of IPC and and towards the end, the uh, there's a this model charge for this addition charge, and there it is. They they say that this the the statement has to be a general one as opposed to a specific one. So my uh, my my. The, I would, uh, Mr. Mathur, <laughs> I I'm I'm grateful for your point, but. Commentaries, I would believe, are illustrative and not uh, clarity of the law. So, if you will be kind enough, just to turn your glance to form uh, to to a the provisions on charge, which is two hundred and seventy to two hundred and twenty-three, and also form number thirty-two, which is beautifully uh, placed. So, if you look at the charge, one twenty-four, a charge is not there. But if you look at the charge under 124, it's very beautifully put, and it clarifies, and it clarifies what is the nature of the charge that ought to be there. The language is specified. It's a second. It may be very useful for you to have a look at. Right, right. Charges with one head. So, may I request uh, Hamlet, ma'am? Thank, thank you, Hamlet, ma'am. Yeah, please interact with the um, senior council. Thank you very much, sir. Actually, it's a wonderful session we had. Um, a good informative session, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Anybody else who want to post questions, raise hands so that uh, I can identify those people and put them online. I just there's one or two questions which I will just respond to. One, Mr. Shankar Ganesh's judgment is there. One other judgment is there, uh, and there's a comment by Ms. Rachna Gupta also. And most people are saying that there must be a there must be effective remedies for malicious prosecution. Having yes, said that, the valid point that is made by one of the uh, uh, one of the persons on the talk is that prosecutions often end in an acquittal, sometimes on technical grounds. now why does this happen the reality of this happening is because as lawyers we are satisfied with getting a client off on technical grounds i'll tell you the flip side of a malicious prosecution uh, of launching a malicious prosecution about 7 or 8 years ago about 15 years ago rather there was a lady who came into india carrying jewelry personal jewelry she belongs to a very very wealthy family from the uk and she was carrying this personal jewelry which technically under the circulars regarding personal baggage you can carry personal jewelry of any amount so she was carrying this it was worth about 1 crore but then uh, she is from a multi billionaires family and is a multi billionaire herself so for her for her it was like you were like an individual carrying a watch for her it was similar to carry that kind of jewelry because she was attending fun weddings functions and she lived half the year in indonesia half the year in delhi and half the year in london gets arrested in the airport custody we the matter goes on uh, we fight it out before the adjudicating authority in the customs department do not succeed we take to the high court the high court division bench quashes the proceeding saying the circulars cover it it was a uh, the the civil proceeding the departmental adjudication proceeding and the show cause notice using the show cause notice we then using the show cause notice judgment we then uh, take a point of taking this prosecution uh, challenging the criminal prosecution we this is not, the conviction has already happened at the appellate stage on the basis of the judgment we are let off our the matter goes to the high court done dismissed all of that meanwhile the client's husband who has seen his wife suffering insists that they file a case for uh, damages and malicious prosecutions are claimed the civil suit is filed and suddenly after many two or three years of delay an slp is filed in supreme court and not only is the slp filed notice is issued it gets admitted and finally i succeed in getting that petition dismissed about 2 years ago and of course the uh, supreme court has dropped the proceedings the civil proceedings against uh, has observed that civil proceedings against the officers should not go on and effectively curtailed our civil proceedings but the fact is that government authorities have a very long rope 
in initiating appellate proceedings or revisional proceedings and seeking condemnation of delay. And because they have that very long rope, it becomes a problem for a person because initiating a malicious prosecution often invites adverse action, legal action against yourself. So most people don't even want to use the existing provisions to take action. We will have to have a fair and efficacious remedy where people's rights can be protected. And that's what I wanted to place before all of you. Thank you, sir. There is one Mr. Dinesh Nair who wants to ask a question. Dinesh Nair, yes, you can ask the question. Good morning, sir. Siddharji, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Nair. Just I'd like to highlight one thing regarding the malicious prosecution, sir. Because from my bar only, it has come Nambi case. Yes, sir. You remember that case, sir? I'm you remember that trial for that when it was there in Supreme Court? The initial round, yes, when the state tried to yeah. take back the investigation and the CBI held on to it and the Supreme Court said, yes, yes. The CBI, you can't take it. Yes, yes, yes. It is a wonderful case. In fact, the charge was that he sold some technology when he was the chief of a ISRO. Yes. That technology was yet to, found, yet, yet to be there in this world, yet to discover. That technology is not there even now. One very intelligent police officer called C.B. Matthew. He was a celebrated police officer in Kerala and he went to NIA or something like that also. They, they made the charges and convinced the trial court in such a way that he has sold it to U.S. And one, uh, uh, that lady called Mariam Rashida, he was, she was second accused. And I don't want to tell her credential because it is an open forum because you know that what was happened inside and how the, how what you call the Kerala police has framed and uh, this thing. And this case is one of the very, uh, this discussion was going on and uh, regarding this malicious prosecution. This one of the, what you call, this has to be, this is the one ideal example, sir. This is one of the ideal example, how a crooked police officer can take one of the most efficient scientists in India. I can say one of the world itself, because I personally associated with that case when it was there in Kerala in my mother -in and uh, his wife become mad and she was uh, what you call the become unsound mind and she become died and his uh, daughter's education has been spoiled and uh, such a malicious this is one of the ideal ideal thing for the malicious prosecution this can be quoted in any of the as a live example or a citation Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank I, think, you. I think it's a valid point. I think it's time we move away from the era of practical policing to effective policing, but fair policing. And that's very important. It is time to have independence of the police because with no interference, so that as our friend uh, Henrik uh, gave the example where the collector told the SP to register an FIR, well, the collector may have administrative control, but the SP should be able to apply his or her own mind to determine whether a case is made out and under what provision. You know, there's a very classic decision R versus uh, of, of, uh, the United, of uh, the United Kingdom, which it says that a constable is not answerable to a minister. He or she is answerable to the law and the law alone and must be only the law. Till we reach that level of policing of administration, we are going to continue to have aberrations. We had a great time. We had a great Thank time, Siddharji. Thank you, Mr. So, Mr. Anand Krishnan, you can ask the question now, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. I remember working with you on a few matters. My question is now this. You've been speaking about uh, Malafide and all that. Should, is it necessary that uh, we can bring about accountability in some manner in the whole process of working in so far as the public servants are concerned? So that uh, that would uh, enforce this uh, and cut the amount of malafide that we could probably think about. I think we have to move towards greater transparency in governance. And that becomes very important and that will reduce mal uh, mal uh, the malafide abuse of power. Uh, while discretion must be protected because public servants will need to take discretionary decisions. But at the same time, that the transparency and regulation will have to come in. One of the biggest problems that we have is how do you test conduct? 
I'll, uh, you know, we are, the way our country socially and economically has developed, different parts of course have developed, some faster, some less, not so fast. But the way the country is developed, a lot of areas are no man's land. So when people want to exercise power, they are secretive about it, which leads to aberrations. And when they're questioned, the reaction is unfortunately a criminal law reaction. So we, while law cannot always keep pace with, with the uh, developments in, so in, in society, in the economy, in an IT age, I think it's time for us to rethink how we are going to frame our laws because frankly, traditionally our laws was parliament or the legislature frames laws and there's regulations issued. In this era, as we have seen under the Epidemic Diseases Act, very short legislation, but gives vast delegated powers because these are things which are to be looked at, like an epidemic, are to be looked at at the regulatory mechanism. In this situation, you can't keep going back to parliament or to the state legislature. So the manner of legislation, manner of governance is to change with more defined working, but with greater power vesting with the delegate, which is the executive, yet contained power, not power which is capable to be abused. And there have to be checks and balances. Checks and balances will enhance the ability to effective use of power, but not effective abuse of power. I Thank hope you, I sir. answered your question. Yes, I did. Thank you, sir. So there is one more person. So he's right in the line, sir. You can ask a question. I'm, I'm Rajini. No, you can ask the question straight in. Please go ahead. Uh, in some cases, there are activists. Uh, a stage of protest, so many other names were also included in the FIR saying the first accused, second accused name will be there. And others, the, the others, so many other names were included. So after acquittal, can they file a, a petition for malicious prosecution seeking compensation? Uh, they can do one of two things. They can file for malicious prosecution. They can they can try and get 182 invoked. They can also file a definition on the initiation of an FIR. There is a, I believe, 1973 judgment called Ascharaj Lal, as I recall, which says that even defamation can lie. But please remember, there's a three year limitation for defamation. So three years from the time of publication and not three years from the time of acquittal. Please keep that oh. in between. They cannot file. Sorry? In between, they cannot file. As soon as the FIR is registered. I, as I was saying, only after an acquittal will you file under 182, etc. for a false allegation. However, for defamation, you can file in between that you have been defamed and that can be filed. I've given you the judgment. I believe it's 1973 judgment. It's Ascharaj Lal. A-S-C-H-A-R-J Lal. I don't remember their full name, but Ascharaj Lal is the judgment. Suppose this, uh, uh, when we when we organize a protest meeting, uh, sometimes we say something emotionally against the state. Does it come under uh, sedition? And what? Uh, how can we quash uh, those? What is the main ground? According to me, an emotional outburst against the state will be covered by the two Supreme Court decisions of uh, Balwan Singh and Bilal Ahmed Kalu. This is settled law. 95 and 97 Supreme Court. Please have a look at it. Those should be your grounds of postment, of course, using Kedar Nath Singh. But those are those will apply to the kind of facts you're telling. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So now Mr. Sankar Ganesh is waiting. Mr. Sankar Ganesh. Hi, sir. Yes, you can look your question now. So in the case of acquittal, if a charge is against a person, uh, he is acquitted from the all charges from the case. Why? Uh, there is no... Uh, why? We can't reopen the case for further investigation of that case because a person who committed the offense is moving freely. A person some, uh, has been hired uh, in, the, in the false case and he has been ended in acquittal. But a person who actually committed the offense is moving freely. So why there is no possibility of uh, reinvestigation of that case? Okay. Let me give you an answer to that. There have been cases where such reinvestigation has been permitted when a certain person is let out. Uh, this has been this principle of reinvestigation when a certain set of accused who 
or falsely prosecuted are tried, whereas the actual set of that has been done, and those matters do end up being investigated. Thank you. You can't Thank put you. a person originally charged to the second prosecution because of Article 300, uh, because Section 300, Article 20. Uh, actually, sir, I'm asking about that, uh, not against that person, sir. When the investigation has to, cannot reopen that investigation. Sir, there have been cases of further investigation which have been launched as against other persons. When the initial set of accused falsely charges being let off, yes, that is permissible. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Rare but permissible. Rare but Thank permissible. Rare but permissible. Thank you, sir. Thanks for the. I would say that uh, out of my heart, bottom of the heart, uh, one of the highly interested sessions, sir, I should thank you for your perseverance, your patience, and your time and energy, sir. And uh, it's uh, most of us, it is a dream come true situation where we are able to um, hear the lecture of a senior counsel um, and uh, get it clarified, sir. We owe a lot to you. Thank you very much, sir, for your kind. Uh, Thank you very much. Kind of you for all of you to have me here. I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Kind of you, sir. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.